Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Ahern. I'm a professor of religious studies here at Manhattan College. I'm also involved in the work of the Dorothy Day Guild and several other organizations that are working to bring this, uh, this, this lecture, this webinar here, uh, especially namely Pax Romana, an international Catholic lay movement. Uh, today's uh, session or today's webinar is the eighth annual Dorothy Day lecture. And this comes and coincides here at Manhattan College, and this coincides with the celebration of our Peace Week. So every year, Manhattan College's Peace and Justice Studies program sponsors a Peace Week. This year, it runs for more than a week. So there's a series of programs, both online and in person, that are happening on our campus uh, in Riverdale. So we're excited that this event is bringing together people from both our campus and beyond to discuss uh, one of the more fascinating people, and I think probably one of the most fascinating New Yorkers uh, that, that has ever lived. So uh, we have a great, great uh, panel lined up here and I want before we start I wanted to just give the floor to George Horton uh, who George if you can just introduce yourself and and describe uh, and George is going to give us an update on where we are in the process for the canonization for Dorothy Day. A lot has happened since our last lecture last year so uh, George can give us some updates uh, and maybe uh, share some ways in which people can get involved. George? Thank you, Kevin, and hi, everybody. It's good to be with you today, and I'm very grateful to Manhattan College and Pax Romana for the depth of their interest in Dorothy Day and, and these annual lectures that have happened. Uh, there's tremendous support from Kevin and, and Manhattan College for, for our efforts at the Dorothy Day Guild, and I'm very, very grateful for that. I, I hope that you've all had a chance to view the great moment on December 8th when we celebrated over 20 years of work uh, in gathering the evidence for Dorothy Day's cause, sealing 34 plus boxes uh, that weighed two thirds of a ton uh, to go to the Congregation for Saints in, in Rome. It was a great moment. Uh, the, the, the cathedral was filled and it, it'll always be very precious. A, about a month later, we actually shipped the boxes and that had been such a sacred event and we had these boxes beautifully sealed. Uh, and it was kind of an anticlimactic when the DHL van pulled up to the loading dock and took these wonderful sacred uh, documents to Rome. But the happiest news was just two weeks ago, we were notified that the Congregation for Saints has these all these boxes, the two thirds of a ton of, of the materials uh, at the congregation. And we look forward to Dorothy being named venerable uh, within one to two years. Uh, some of us hope that might even be sooner if uh, uh, Francis gets wind that, that, that it's all there and ready for him to make a, make a decision. Uh, this also marks a, a change in some of the functioning of the guild. Uh, excuse me for the phone ringing in the background. Uh, this also, it also results in a change, a transition uh, for the guild. We spent 20 years gathering the evidence. Now we need to shift to a greater promulgation of the work and life of Dorothy Day as a model for, for Catholics, for Christians, for, for, for all people. In, in this very, very difficult time. We also have to work on finding a miracle. And there you could be of help to us. If there's anything, any favor that you've uh, asked of Dorothy, uh, please let us know about that. Uh, the problem of the uh, miracle is, is a major, major step that we have to uh, accomplish before she is named blessed. Uh, so again, there's lots of volunteer opportunities, opportunity to join the guild, to participate in this uh, transition exp experience. If you go to DorothyDayGuild.org, uh, you'll be able to, to access a lot of information, opportunity to join us in this process. I, I'd just like again to thank Kevin and Colleen Dule, who are on our advisory committee and uh, 
as we go forward, look forward to their taking leadership roles. So, and, and great thanks to so many people and so many, uh, one of the great things was the way the, the, a wide spectrum of people in the church contributed to this moment. And uh, we hope that continues. So Kevin, thank you. Great. And, the, you know, I think uh, the other members of the, the guild and people who have been involved what really are appreciative of the work that George has done on this and leading and helping to lead a lot of these efforts. Uh, and I think all of us would agree that as we look to the process to share Dorothy Day and to share her mission, it's important that it's not just about her, but it's about her reading of the gospel and the works of mercy. Uh, and, you know, every day it seems like, or I feel like every week, there's some other article in a secular major news article, news source about Dorothy Day. She's clearly capturing the imagination of people. Uh, the new Staten Island Ferry, which I'm not sure when, if we have a date of when it's going to be arriving in, in New York Harbor, but the new Staten Island Ferry is going to be named after Dorothy Day. So we're excited and when the weather gets nicer and it's not for 20 degrees out to get on there uh, and to tour the New York Harbor. Uh, but, you know, she's been called many things, a radical, a holy fool. Uh, Abby Hoffman, you know, the, the described her as the first hippie. Uh, but perhaps one of the most important elements of her, uh, of her life, in addition to being a holy, fool, holy woman and, and uh, radical uh, and pacifist and anarchist, is that she was a journalist. Uh, and she was a working mother, a grandmother, uh, and she, the, but the voca her vocation as a journalist is one that hasn't been explored as much as I think it could be. So this year, as we were calling together this panel, uh, I said, well, let's, let's bring some journalists, especially journalists from outside the Catholic worker movement, who can maybe share about, uh, reflect on what it's like to be a Catholic journalist in the world and in the moment today, and how Dorothy Day uh, it might inform her. So uh, to introduce our panelists, I, I'll ask uh, one of our uh, student uh, journalists here on campus, uh, Anna Woods, who's coming out, out of our Quadrangle newspaper uh, to introduce our, our three speakers today. And then we'll go around with a few questions and leave the floor open to question and answers from the participants. So we have a good number of participants with us today from, from more than one country. And so folks can please uh, uh, put put your questions uh, as we go in the Q&A feature. So Anna, please introduce our three panelists and then we'll start with the questions. Welcome everyone. I am thrilled to introduce our talented and esteemed panelists today, Eileen Markey, Colleen Dully, and Melissa Sabio. Eileen Markey is the author of A Radical Faith, The Assassination of Sister Mora, a biography of Mora Clark, one of four U.S. church women killed by U.S. trained forces in El Salvador in 1980. She's the editor of Without Compromise, the brave journalism that first exposed Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and the American epidemic of corruption, an anthology of the work of Village Voice investigative reporter Wayne Barrett, by whom Markey was trained. She is a journalist who has written for The Wall Street Journal, New York Magazine, The Daily Beast, The New Republic, Jacobin, The Village Voice, WNYC, New York Public Radio and City Limits, as well as America, Commonweal, and The National Catholic Reporter. She is currently an assistant professor of journalism at Lehman College of the City University of New York, where she continues to write about social movements, public policy, and the intersection of faith and political life. Her work increasingly focuses on the role of public memory in forming allegiances and shaping perceptions of the present. Colleen Dully is a multimedia journalist covering Catholic and Vatican news. In her current position as associate editor at American Media, Colleen writes and edits Vatican news and analysis pieces. Along with hosting and producing the weekly news podcast Inside the Vatican, her forthcoming biography of the French author, social worker, and mystic Madeleine de Brel will be published by Liturgical Press. And Melissa Cedillo was born and raised in California's Coachella Valley. She attended Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, where she earned a BA in theological studies. After college, Melissa spent time in Washington, D.C. as a campaign associate for faith and public life, working to defend the integrity of the 2020 census. Melissa then went on to complete an MTS at Harvard Divinity School, where she studied religion, ethics, and politics through a public policy lens. Melissa currently works at the National, Catholic, the National Catholic Reporter at the Latino Catholics Fellow. She is passionate about bridging the gap between progressive politics and religion in America. Melissa is dedicated to learning about and advocating for preventative domestic violence policy, reproductive justice, immigration advocacy, pushing for prison divestment and decarceration work. Their work is truly inspiring and it's an honor to hear from them today. Welcome. Thank you, Anna. 
And thank you to our panelists. Uh, today, in two of my classes, we were covering the start of the Catholic Worker newspaper and reflecting on how, as this work of, of the church uh, was started, Dorothy Day didn't have an expectation that it would turn into a movement and turn into a whole other uh, other other thing that probably was unimaginable to her uh, in May 1933 when the first issue came out. So as a journalist uh, and a writer, the uh, first question to the three of you is, how, how does her witness and legacy inspire you, challenge you? What does it have to offer to what you're doing? Uh, and we'll, we'll let the, leave it open like that and let you all respond. So how does, how does she inspire you or challenge you? Eileen, are you? you, you I don't know. I'm wishing we could all actually make eye contact so we can yeah. give each other nonverbal cues on who would like to talk. Right. Maybe you can actually call sure. on us. Absolutely. Go. Yeah. Eileen, please. Um, how does her? How does her witness inspire? Yeah. Um, when, when I think about her career as a journalist, right? I think about um, obviously, I think about her commitment to truth. And well, first of all, I, I love that you've arranged the panel this way. Um, I think all of us are, you know, spend a fair amount of time in this fair, like Dorothy Day has been informative to many of our lives and to many of our, the ways in which we understand our Catholicism uh, and the way we understand our position in the world. Um, but she's, you are correct. She's so rarely addressed as a journalist, right? It, it's as the founder of the movement, uh, it's as this great radical, it's as this great like, uh, refuser, right? Refuser to go along. You always think of that fantastic photograph, right? That iconic photograph of her sitting in the chair during the air raid uh, drills. Um, so thank you for framing Dorothy Day as the journalist that she was. And because that's the frame I'm thinking about, one of the things that's wonderful to think about her is, is that she came out of this milieu of a really rich ecosystem of opposition press. So of course we understand her as founding the Catholic, you know, co-founder of the Catholic worker movement and of the newspaper, but that was not her first newspaper, right? She was a regular New York City working press person um, in a time when New York had a really fecund world of radical leftist press. Um, and so there was not one newspaper, right? She wrote for the masses, but um, she wrote for the newspaper that was called The Masses. But there were many such papers and every sort of faction of the leftist movement had its own party organ and had its own papers. And then there were literary ones and more news focused ones and international ones. And, you know, she was obviously writing in English but there were several papers in Yiddish and several papers in, in French and right. Um, and so I think what's inspiring about Dorothy Day is understanding that her quest to tell the truth, uh, her quest to witness like she was a journalist actually before she was a Catholic, right? Um, and so is there something rich and important to understand there? Uh, her desire to see, the, to see the world, to tell the truth about what she saw and the ability that she was given because of that rich ecosystem of a leftist press in the, in the teens and in the twenties, um, that led her on the path, right? Like, you know, we have, we, we know the story, we've read the books, but but it was her role as a journalist that led her into the places where she then understood God in the way in the way she spent the rest of her life proclaiming. Um, so she and her father was a journalist, right? So she came into journalism because she believed in in wanting to see up close uh, and up tactile and and for real to understand what the world was. And in seeing that, it led her into this faith, and then it led her into being. Uh, the particular type of Catholic that she was and the particular type of one that we're talking about a hundred years later. Um, so I think that's actually one of the things that inspires me when I think about her as a journalist. I'm like, right, she was a journalist first. And there's something holy and profound and good about journalism, um, about that instinct to witness and to tell, to witness and to proclaim. And and then it it led her into these other parts of her life that that we honor her for. Thank you, uh, Melissa. What do you? Wh how does she inspire you? Yeah, I think the or I know one of the reasons I love Dorothy Day is because I myself was not raised Catholic, 
um, I chose to become Catholic. My parents are not Catholic. Um, and I was, I would say an organizer first and a Catholic second, um, but becoming Catholic made sense with my organizing background. Um, and so it was a little bit of a surprise to me when I started entering the Catholic world and I was like, wait, we're not all, um, coming from this Jesuit education where we want to be organizers. Um, there's, there's a diversity of Catholics. And so it was a little bit of a shock and a little bit of a challenge. Um, and I took a class my junior year of college that was specifically on Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day. And I remember being like, I can't relate to all of her, but there's so many specific things that are so human. Um, and I think that that's the reason that she is adaptable to secular papers as well as that sometimes these faith figures are seen as so holy and so almost perfect um, that it's hard to relate to them. But I think Day, the way that she writes about herself in the world and has been written about is relatable. And then I think for me as well, I originally did not go to school for journalism. I went for theological studies um, and I thought I wanted to take that into like bioethics, right? Um, and it was through a lot of mentorship um, and the reaching out of folks older than me being like, hey, you love to write and you love to write about faith and justice and organizing. Have you thought about this as a, as a career? Um, so I think those are the things about her that really inspire me. I think what, what her legacy challenges me is I think right now when I read about her um, as someone who does a lot of uh, young kind of organizing, I see her and I'm like, that's so cool. And I also wonder, how do we um, not admire folks for them being radical in the past? How do we um, admire them today? Um, especially when my generation is so um, kind of labeled as leaving the church and not wanting to have a religious organization and you know fill in the blank and also being told that they are too radical or too um, idealistic, fill in the blank, right? Um, and so how do we you know, challenge ourselves to not wait until someone has, you know, passed, which is always a challenge with every figure, right? Um, but I think for me specifically, uh, I use that to challenge myself and to others that we maybe sometimes push out of media for being too radical. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, Colleen. Yeah. Um, I guess what stands out to me most about Dorothy as a journalist specifically is First, that she was fearless. She was on the ground. She was actually meeting people, you know, boots on the street and all that, which is exactly what you want to be as a reporter. Um, I think that it's way too easy, especially in the age of COVID, to kind of be more distanced. And I definitely get that writing for a, a New York magazine covering the Vatican from Louisiana, right? So uh, I, I really admire that about her, about how she was so committed to being up close with the people who were affected by the policy decisions that were made in the halls of power, but telling the stories of the people who were affected by them and, and evaluating those policies through how they affected those people. I think that's exactly what, what we should be doing. Um, another thing that's stood out to me, I guess, especially recently is just how smart she was. She was always making efforts to educate herself politically, especially. Um, she read and she wrote voraciously. And she also wrote to work out her own thoughts on things, right? I, a few of us have been involved in transcribing her diaries. And so we know that's where she worked out some of her thoughts uh, before she then sent them to press. I, so I've come to appreciate, especially lately, that that constant effort to learn and her, yeah, her dedication to really really understanding the ideas that she's then going to talk about so forcefully. I think I, yeah, recently I've been realizing my own like deficiencies in, I've been being pushed to analyze the Vatican more. And I'm like, well, I really, I don't have all the historical context. And so I've been going through this like self-imposed curriculum of reading Vatican history books and, and it helps so much. And so that's just something that I've noticed a lot about Dorothy lately. And I guess in terms of challenges, Eileen was getting at this when she was talking about, you know, it was a very different media landscape when Dorothy was writing versus our landscape today, or even like what we would consider just like legacy media. Um, 
you know, there is one paper of record in New York now, according to most people. And so, but I think that the way that Dorothy wrote combining uh, her politics and the storytelling, it challenges the model of objectivity that I was taught in journalism school. And that I think is like sort of slowly being eroded by the way that the media industry works now. So, you know, Dorothy wasn't aiming to be objective. Her work was clearly meant to propagate a certain set of political views and spark her readers to take action based on that. She started as a reporter and she's she's driven by that desire to be with people on the margins and learn their stories and then be moved to act on them. But her work blends this line between theory and reporting and that raises questions for me as somebody who was who was trained as a reporter who's naturally drawn to reporting but who feels pushed by the direction of the industry and by my own editors to write more analysis and opinion um and yeah i guess i'll talk a little later about how how my views have been kind of changing on that in light of dorothy and in light of where i see the media industry going but that's that's a challenge for me I think Colleen is saying that bringing up these really interesting points, like um, the current media industry, which is like an unholy set of words, um, is is really focused on opinion, right? It's really focused on opinion, whereas Dorothy, who we know had an ideology, had a few ideologies. Um, really, what the value of the Catholic worker is and and was. The facts in it actually right the facts are what's valuable there um you know dorothy the, the catholic worker did a really great job of covering for example back in the in the 30s the southern farm worker tenant union movement right it wasn't only stuff that happened in union square that they covered or stuff that happened on the lower east side but obviously they were deeply attuned to and allied with obviously but attuned to covering the news that came out of the rural farm workers, black and poor white led tenant farm workers in the South under, you know, during the depression, right? A, a very much, a, yeah, anyway, a movement of tenant farm workers um, that, that ended up having a big influence on some of how the New Deal played out, some of how the, the New Deal agricultural intervention stuff played out. And that movement was really trained the people who then later, in the 40s and 50s became the foot soldiers of the early parts of the civil rights movement, right? Like those people weren't born out of the head of Zeus. They had been in the Southern Farm Worker Tenant Union movement first. And anyway, if you were reading the Catholic Worker in the late 20s and throughout the mid 30s, you were hearing news about the Southern Farm Worker Tenant Union. You wouldn't have read that in the Times because the Times had an ideology and it wasn't an ideology of covering poor people movements, right? It was an ideology of fearing those sorts of movements and it still is. And so, but the value of that wasn't the opinion, actually. The value of it was the reporting, was the going to Georgia and hearing what the demands of this movement were and what the, what the goals were and what the strategy was and what the local and long-term goals were, right? That's reporting, that's journalism. Um, sitting in New York and saying, you know, the revolution will come when, that's opinion. And it has like, it has as much, it doesn't have a lot of value, right? Somebody needs to do it in order to inform movements and in order for people to be able to build up strong and um, effective strategy, right? You need to be able to dream forward in order to figure out what the local and proximate goals are. But the journalism comes in like actually going and saying like, well, here they sat in at this place. They refused to pay these taxes. They, they refused to pay these rents. They withheld whatever the radishes they were growing that they owed to their owner, right? Um, and that's just facts, that's just news. And I, f so like, of course the Catholic worker was never neutral. It wasn't, that wasn't the point of it, nor was the masses, nor were all these other papers. Um, but they did really valuable journalism because they went places and they, they witnessed things and then they wrote them down and then they told the rest of us readers about them. Um, and the methods, of journalism or the thing that's meant to be objective. Of course, we're not objective. Like this is what I tell my students. Of course, we're not objective, right? Like I'm against child trafficking. I'm not gonna pretend I'm not, right? Like 
I'm a I'm opposed to the government stealing children and separating them from their parents. I, I'm not none of us are neutral on that fact, I hope. But the point of the journalist is that their methods are objective, right? The way we talk about it in journalism classes are that cancer researchers are not neutral. They want to find a cure for cancer, right? They're, they're, you're not in a lab like working for 30 years to find like some mutation on a gene because you have no particular feelings about cancer, right? You're doing it because you want to cure it, but your methods are objective. You wash your hands before you go into the lab. You only, right? You're, you're, and so that's what we do in journalism if we're doing it right is that we're going out to find the facts and we're not gonna mess with those facts. And we're not going to ignore the voices of people who are annoying or inconvenient or confusing uh, or whose movements seem marginal or whose movements seem like riddled with communists. We're actually gonna report on that stuff. Uh, whereas less objective, but perhaps more mainstream organizations do, do ignore those movements because like, it's a little too scary, right? So I think of the, the great journalistic power of the Catholic worker really being that that very simple, hey, there's some stuff going on in Tennessee, let's go. Let's go and see. Uh, let's go tell those stories and listen to those stories and then write them down and promulgate them out through our newspaper. Um, and of course, you know, of course there's plenty of opinion. She wasn't writing like inverted pyramid stories, yeah. Um, but but she was really telling, you know, there was reporting in there. It wasn't polemic or it wasn't only polemic. And that's why it was valuable. It's so easy. Like we know to tune out polemic. Um, and it's the, I mean, I think the reason there's so much analysis and opinion in news, in mainstream news today um, is that it's cheap, right? It's really easy to just give somebody a microphone and ask them how they feel about something or ask them to pontificate on something. It doesn't require any background knowledge. It doesn't require any of what Colleen's doing now, of like giving herself a history and, and you know, a, a master's degree in, in Vatican history. Um, and it doesn't require developing sources and building trust and figuring out what's gonna happen. It's just, well, I think, right? Um, and maybe it's, it, maybe it's like one of these lovely Catholic workers sort of confounding issues that this very ideological and not neutral newspaper, what was valuable about it was actually its objective reporting. What, what was valuable about it was its going to the ground and hearing, here's, here's what people are doing. We're gonna tell you about what people are doing, um, which I can say some other things about, but I've talked too long, sorry. So, so, so Eileen, you're, you're sort of drawing attention to, to this somewhat, that we're living in this post-truth media, truth cultural landscape, right? And so there might be a, there might be on the surface, a perceived tension between the pursuit of truth and some sort of objectivity, right? Is, is that sort of pointing out? So Melissa or Colleen, what do you, what do you, what are you thinking to what, what Eileen was just raising there? I think that what Eileen and Colleen are getting at is that like, how do we um, think about day in conversation of movement journalism, right? Uh, movement journalism is being talked about currently, but it's not new. If you look at the history of uh, slavery and abolition, the history of lynching of some of the country's most famous journalists um, who come before day, right? It was, you were attending said protests and you were also writing on them. Um, and I think that that's what's so inspiring about Day is this idea that like we don't wonder where she stood on issues. Um, and it didn't make us trust her more or her reach the idea of truth any less. Um, I think what I kind of wrestle with um, in a larger uh, context, not just in Catholic media, but journalism media across the board is who gets to um, do those types of pieces and oftentimes like if you look at the uh, racial and gender disparities among who gets columns or who gets to do editing, right? It's overwhelmingly white. Um, Catholic media is not immune to that. And so how do we take these great pieces that they wrote and investigated when it came to things about race and um, what you know ends up being the civil rights, what ends up being anti-imperialism? And then how do we ask ourselves in Catholic media, who are the women of color talking about these things from very lived experiences, right? Um, Dorothy Day was very clear that her family upbringing brought her to where she was. How do we also say if someone says, 
I am undocumented, therefore I'm radically opposed uh, to uh, borders and I you know, believe in abolishing ICE. How do we as Catholic media say, here's a platform for you? Um, instead of saying that's too radical, tone it down. How do we say, you know, as um, New York comes the epicenter for one of the most fully funded police departments, um, what would it look like for Dorothy Day to write in the moment of, you know, a lot of young folks calling for the defunding of police? I don't think she would have taken a, a neutral stance. Um, and obviously all of us could go around and theorize what we think Day would say. And we do this a lot with historical figures. Um, but I think it, it's important because there are real things happening right now. Um, you know, you could take Ukraine as an example. What would it have looked like for someone to say, actually, I don't believe in American intervention at all right now in a Catholic media platform as a, uh, a young person of color? I, I, I don't know. I don't know that we would have been all um, welcoming to that stance. And again, I don't think all were welcoming of everything they said, um, especially in the Catholic world, right? They tried very hard to get the word Catholic out of Catholic worker. Um, but I say all of that because I think there is also a lens of, you know, what does movement journalism, what does this idea of um, obje objective journalism, what does this idea of searching for truth mean when the added layer is for a lot of people of color who are doing reporting, um, these aren't far away issues. These are very personal issues. Um, and that's, that's beautiful, right? That's something to be celebrated. And also kind of what Colleen was touching on is traditional journalism is actually like, no, that's a conflict of interest. Um, so, you know, how do, how do we sit in that tension? And I think Day invites us to really own in our own personalized um, way and not in an ego way, but in a way of saying that that helps us stand and understand um, when we're reporting as this type of accompaniment, not this, we just dip into this community and leave after we've reported on the issue. Oh, I'm wondering, Anna, as someone who's doing journalism on the at the campus level, do you have any any reactions to any of this conversation? I think what you're talking about is really important, like this objectivity and through the lens of Dorothy Day. I think as a student journalist, um, a lot of times there comes a point where, you know, that our own personal ideology can affect what we're writing, especially since, you know, we're living in this community and working in this community as well. Um, but I, I think, I think it is a challenge for every journalist, but, you know, Dorothy Day did such a great job at that. It's really interesting to kind of peg her as kind of a role model of sorts and, you know, take inspiration from her, you know, in the 21st century now. So, I mean, in many ways, like she, she is, I forget how we say, how it was phrased in, in the guild is a woman of our time, right? In, in a way, she is very much of, of our moment, but at the some, at a certain level, she is also distant from some of the moment that we're in now, right? So, uh, how, I, so I'm curious for, for, for the three of you, how do you understand your vocation as a journalist in this moment in 2022? Like, what does it mean to be a journalist now? Uh, I, I'm really curious to hear what, how you see yourselves, if you've had time to reflect on that self-reflection. Self Maybe uh, Melissa first. I just put a cough drop in. Is yeah. Colleen able to go? I'm yeah, so Colleen, sorry. Colleen, I'm so no sorry. <laughs> oh, I hope you feel better soon. <laughs> um, if I can like respond to some of the things that were said earlier, because I thought they were awesome. Uh, I really appreciated Eileen's point about the reporting being like so high quality in the Catholic worker and being like perhaps its greatest power. As we were preparing for this, I was like, I can't wait to hear what Eileen says because <laughs> I very much look up to her as a, as a journalism example and role model. But, um, and then to Melissa's point about access and like who was given a place in these newsrooms yeah, it, I, I don't have the numbers, but it may even be worse in the Catholic media than in the rest of the media landscape. Um, but I, I wanted to add to that economic access is a huge thing. And especially when you look at like journalism schools or who is able to take unpaid internships, right? Like journalism so often is favoring people who come from wealthy families. And that is not representative of the stories that we want to tell, right? We want to 
this used to be a, a, a working class job and I think that it still should be in many ways. Um, and then I wanted to raise a question about, you know, we were talking about the importance of covering these like movements that might be a little bit too niche. Um, and I was wondering, like, maybe we could talk about how that relates to movements that are way too niche on the other side, right? Like, I think, you know, you look at within Vatican or church reporting, at least somebody like Archbishop Vigano, who is on the far, far right, who's promoted conspiracy theories. And it's like, well, most of the media has taken on this unofficial policy of we're pretty much going to ignore him unless he says something really, really crazy. And yeah, that's, that is like solidifying our selection bias against these things. And so, yeah, I, I wonder what you make of that. But as for, uh, how I understand my own vocation as a journalist, I've really moved towards this model of explainer journalism. I just like feel very at home with that. And I feel like it meshes together kind of where, where I feel comfy in terms of like objective reporting and analysis. Um, there's this great explainer from a Vox editor named David Roberts. I can post a link to it after this, but he explains kind of what explainer journalism is as embodied by Vox, who I think do it very well. And it basically acknowledges like, we all have our opinions, we have our ideologies and the target isn't, you know, objectivity as in neutrality, like, like uh, Eileen was clarifying, but it's fairness. And the best way to achieve fairness is by painting as full of a picture of the facts and the context, the facts in context as possible. You know, you tell the story about the person who's affected by X policy, and then you explain how and why that policy came about and how it's affecting other people and the big, the big questions that come up around it and the solutions that are on the table. There's also, you know, the body of thought of like solutions journalism, where you report on and evaluate somebody's attempt to fix a problem. Uh, and then other times you find yourself proposing solutions yourself, which is more in line with, you know, like Dorothy's writing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel I like explainer journalism a lot. I like that it challenges me to like really learn the context and then communicate that in an understandable way. I think that's especially important for something like the Vatican, which is very much the halls of power, right? Um, to be able to understand how all these different bodies within the Vatican are working, but not to get tied up in that. And instead to say, okay, but for my readers, and this is a question I ask all the time, why does it matter? How does this affect regular people? And with the Vatican, sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes that isn't going to trickle down and that's okay too. And so uh, I, I find it really helpful to, to kind of ground my work in that, but to focus on the explaining uh, and the contextualizing. Sorry, that was a ton. No, that was that's great. It's nice to be able to like think. <laughs> it's nice to be able to ah right. I'm gonna uh, receive what Colleen said and think about it for a minute or twenty. Um, but I won't give you that much dead air. Um, uh, synodality, Eileen. Right, listening. <laughs> listening. Yeah, exactly. No, really listening. So the power, I think, of of the kind of journalism Dorothy did, or just the power of good journalism, um, what is good journalism, is, is in going close to where the information is. And I guess to, to, to kind of like re-answer one of Kevin's earlier questions, what, what witness does she offer today? Or what are you inspired by? It's, it's that going that it's that orientation of journalism that says the people who are the experts on this issue are the people whom who are being affected by it right um and then like how does that affect the kind of journalism i do or the kind of career i have right like because of a formation through the catholic worker and, and through that that way of thinking about the world right i stand in a certain place and you're gonna see what you see depends on where you stand, right? So what you see depends on where you've planted yourself and where your life is and who your peers are and who your orientation is. Um, and I, I see different things because of the kind of work I do year after year and the place I live, and the, right? Um, it also means that you start to understand like where the real expertise is. And so if you wanted to understand how the depression was playing out among agricultural workers, you went and talked to the Southern Tenant Farm Workers Union. Um, 
If you want to understand how the economy works, you talk to the people who are getting screwed by it. That's who has a proper comprehension of the economy, right? Who is an expert on the economy? Who has comprehension of the economy in the United States? The people who are getting screwed by it understand how the economy works. The people who are designing it clearly don't, right? Like they're playing a certain game, designing a certain system or, or tinkering with it or trying to administer it or doing whatever it is, sometimes in good conscience, sometimes with good goals, sometimes with nefarious goals, generally with just cloistered goals. But the people who are the experts, the people who hold the comprehension are the people who are getting kicked by it, right? Um, and I think that is perhaps like the thing I understand most about journalism throughout like, the, you know, I have a lot of gray hair, right? Throughout a 30 year at this point, kind of in interaction with it, that the expertise lies in the impact um, and that that's who you have to go to. And so what in thinking about synodality, I suppose really is like, what I love about journalism is the going to and is the listening to people who know um, and, and realizing who it is who knows and then knowing who those people are because of where you've positioned yourself. So you know, you know who, who to find, right? Um, and I think the, the real inspiration for me in the kind of journalism that the worker represents um, is not, and, and you know, Melissa made reference to IDB Wells a, a few minutes ago and, and to, you know, movement journalism of that sort, a long, long history of it. Um, it's not just in that we catalog all the things that are wrong with society, right? Like there, there's people who are like, oh, I don't read the news because it's so depressing. Um, and I, I, I kind of resonate with that, frankly. Uh, I'm not proud of resonating with it, but I understand it. Um, but the, the power of this great journalism is not just that it catalogs what's wrong with the world, but, but that it is going to the people who are working to change that, right? And so there's a difference between the like sob story, poverty porn, disaster porn kind of coverage, which we see a lot in mainstream media, really, um, which it might come out of a place of some sort of like remedial compassion, um, but it ends up often doing quite something quite nasty. Um, even while it's trying to be compassionate, it does something quite nasty. Um, and that's because it's not good journalism, <laughs> because it's not actually grounded, right? If you're using if you're using your lab coat properly, if it's grounded properly, you're going to end up with good results. And that means listening to the people who really know, um, being grounded enough that you know who really knows. And so the power I think that I draw from the kind of journalism that that the worker represents um, is that, it, and what I try to replicate in my own kind of reporting and writing, is that you're telling the story of the resistance, right? You're not just saying, here's all the things that are wrong. You're, it's, it's important, of course, first to name the things that are wrong or that somebody names them. But the power isn't just in naming them. The power is in, in telling the story of the people who are resisting what is wrong. Mm -hmm. And you could replace the word resisting, right? With rebuilding what is right, right? With rebuilding, you know, the new society and the shell of the old. And it's that, and in doing that, you're, you're necessarily not drawing these helpless victims, right? You're doing a much more dangerous thing, a much more transformative and important. And this is why we don't see so much of it thing, which is showing the power of the people who do have agency, who are working. And I mean, that's why the worker and any of these other radical and marginal presses are, are valuable for historians because, you know, you can have the one, oh yeah, it was terrible. People were all on soup lines. Like, well, no, actually, People were on soup lines and they were involved in 400 political parties and they had this agenda and they were in cohort with people around the world and they were part of this and they were part of that and they had strategies and they had weekly meetings and they had goals right and so a, a radical journalism takes seriously those movements in opposition not as curiosities but as something that is newsworthy and i mean you see this you see this so often in any sort of outsider, like I don't really like those terms, but right, in some, any sort of not mainstream or whatever kind of press, that the value of it isn't that it's saying, hey, there's poverty. The power of it is that they're talking to the people who really, really understand poverty and are working against it in an organized um, and focused fashion. 
and anyway, that's what I think I draw from like an inspiration of this kind of press is, is taking seriously the movements um, and reporting on them in such a way that you're telling the stories of agency. And then, and then people can't say they didn't know, right? And people can't say that we didn't know there was any resistance. Of course there was resistance. And here, I wrote it down for you. Here's what the resistance is, right? And here's the people who are very smart and who've been working on it for a long time. Um, you know, this came up in some reporting I've been doing around COVID um, where, you know, I talked to some great Bronx activists and then they're like, yeah, it was really funny to read those articles in the beginning of COVID where like America learns that there was poverty. Uh, yeah, I could have told you, you know, I've been working on it. I've been working on it for 30 years to talk about the mm -hmm. lack of access to healthcare in low income communities, to talk about food deserts, to talk about transportation deserts. Yeah, uh-huh, <laughs> I, I got some receipts I can show you. We've been working on it. Congratulations, welcome to the party. Now that now you know what I know, right? Uh, this is, you know, this is coming from like women of color, poor people activists in the Bronx, like, uh-huh. Now we're at page one and let me tell you, right? And so I think a powerful journalism tells those stories, but I also think, and I don't really know where Dorothy uh, comes down on this or would fall in this. Um, a powerful movement journalism isn't beholden to the movement, right? And like one of the most powerful things about Dorothy Day, one of the things that makes her confounding and incredibly difficult, right? is that she was really like this non-joiner uh, and she had something critical to say about everybody all the time. Uh, and she left her Union Square world, right? She left the masses, she left those papers, she left those organizations because she had this different and longer term and kind of neo-medieval view of the world. Um, she could have continued on forever being a didactic leftist in a network of, of media landscape that existed until the 60s, right? Um, and in all these parties that, that still exist, right? Um, but she wasn't that joiner and a good journalism doesn't belong to party, right? If, if we're talking about Union Square in the 20s, we're talking about the Communist Party, but if we're, whatever, it doesn't actually belong to any particular movement. It belongs to what's true and it goes to the roots and tells stories and it focuses on agency, but it's also able to say, these people have become crooks or these people are disappointing or that was a nice strategy, but it turns out it doesn't work or we've gotten to a feedback loop that's uh, unproductive now. And so that's where some like, you know, I'm obviously the oldest person here. Um, some sort of, yeah, it's, it's an archaic notion of understanding that the journalist isn't at the party. Like the journalist is not part of the march. The journalist in their heart of hearts might hope the march wins, but our power and our value and the thing we bring is to be the one who can say, it's time to separate now, or that isn't working, or uh, my commitment is to the truth. My commitment is not to this organization or even the, the, the proximate goals of this organization. And I'm gonna just tell the stories um, and I'm gonna therefore be able to step out even when it's gonna offend some of my friends, even when it's gonna be non-orthodox, right? Even when it's gonna get me denounced, get me unplatformed because my commitment is to telling what's true. And, that's not the commitment of an activist, right? The commitment of an activist is to telling their side. Thank you. I, I mean, I, one of the things I love about your response is you almost suggest a type of liberation journalism of an option for the poor embedded into embedded into the journalist endeavor, uh, if I heard correctly. Uh, I, I want to make sure we have room for some of the questions we come that are coming from from our participants here. Uh, Anna, you've been going through. We have a few questions in the in the chat, but also in the Q and A. Uh, you want to pick pick one or two to ask uh, ask our panelists, and then we can I'm sure bring in other things that, that others want to say too. So we have a question in the Q&A box from Miriam Ford. Reading The Catholic Worker, it's clear that issues of immigration and race are acceptable to be explored. Less acceptable are issues of reproductive justice and sexuality. Is it the responsibility of readers or of the journalists to push the limits? I am, I'll, I'll answer, or I'll start to answer. Um, I think that's something I've been interested in about because Day was very clear about where she stood on abortion and birth control and also, right, it's not a surprise that she writes about having had an abortion. And then on top of that, there, like she interviewed, I think, and I think all of you would be able to fact this, check this, um, 
I think she interviewed Margaret Sanger's sister, but then she also interviewed like Trotsky, I think. All of you, if this is wrong, please tell me. Um, but I think what's interesting here is um, specifically to my point of like women of color and media and my my coworker editor, uh, Olga Segura always talks about like Catholic media has a whiteness problem. And um, I think when we talk about race and immigration, even there, it's who gets to have the columns on, on those issues in Catholic media across the board. But then when it comes to sexuality and when it comes to reproductive justice, especially in a moment, um, you know, when there's some landmark legislation about to come down in June, what does it look like um, for Catholic media to capture, you know, women of color who are questioning where they stand on the SCOTUS decision on Catholic teaching about women of color who identify as trans or queer? Um, are they openly allowed to talk about these multiple identities that we hold for ourselves and for our community? And, um, you know, to, like, to, to get at your question, I, I think that there is, that is a uh, very, uh, on point observation that there are certain things that the the media shies away from, but I think if if we are talking about those who are most impacted, um, what is our obligation? You know, when there is a lot of violence towards folks who identify as trans, there are a lot of anti-trans laws going into motion across the country. There is a clear teaching on uh, trans identity by the church. What does that mean as the obligation of movement journalists who are Catholic, who have an obligation towards the truth, and those who feel violence most profoundly from these? Um, that's a really, like, you know, pulling back and forth type of question. And absolutely, it is a space that is, that is needed um, in Catholic journalism because the Catholic Church holds so much power over what people think when it comes into, in terms of gender and sexuality. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> I would chime in. Um, this is an interesting question about whether it's on the journalists or the readers to, to push those limits. Um, I mean, definitely, like, I think that readers should be writing letters to the editor when they aren't happy with coverage. Please, please do that, because that, we will probably give you a platform. Um, it is interesting to see because we have some precedent for how this went down in the Catholic Worker. Um, we know that, you know, there was a group of very progressive young student types who were working at the Catholic newspaper at Catholic Worker newspaper who wanted to push some of the limits, especially on talking about sexuality. And Dorothy said no. Dorothy pretty much shut it down. And it's interesting, Michael Lachlan, my colleague in America, writes about this in his book, Hidden Mercy, which is about the AIDS crisis and the Catholic Church's response to it, that even as Dorothy was much older and retired from the paper, the younger editors wanted to write about homosexuality. And they went to Dorothy and they said, hey, you know, will this be okay? And she said, well, it's, it's your newspaper now, do what you want to. But they knew that Dorothy wouldn't have been okay with that. And so they held themselves back. And I think that's an interesting decision. And I think, you know, maybe that gets into the question of like a, a mission-driven publication, like how you did handle things that, uh, yeah, that, that maybe go against the, the ideology that your newspaper is trying to espouse. Um, I personally like to err more on the side of like, yeah, let's publish conflicting opinions because then people can make their minds up by reading it. Um, but yeah, so, so just thought I would point out that, that this decision, this, this kind of thing did happen in the Catholic Worker newspaper and that's, that's how it went. And it particularly, right, is a great example of, of, of an interactive paper, right? It was, it was a, it was communicating with the movement and and beyond the movement. It was communicating with the houses and or it, it is communicating with the houses and without beyond the houses. Um, and it it always has published these very long rebuttals, right? Here I'm saying something, and now here will be the 300, the 3,000 word response, right? And and you saw these great debates go back and forth, right? Um, I'm thinking of like Berrigan and and Cardinal, right? Um, but other more contemporary things really like big airing of thoughts around racial justice and thoughts about Black Lives Matter and Ferguson and like 
big painful conversations in the paper in the last five, six years, right? That played out in, ex in exactly that way. Like here's a column and then next month, here's a very long response to it. And so that's, that's sort of like a, a early version of the horizontality that we see in, in media today, right? Of the reporter has put something out and then they're gonna bet a bunch of tweets about it. And then the a whole dialogue is gonna run out in the, in the tweets at the side of the article. Um, yeah, so, so I think there's always a, a, there's a dialectic between the readership and the reporter, the readership and the publication uh, that pushes and expands coverage. And, you know, you mentioned Margaret Sanger and you think that, well, actually ideas aren't settled, right? Like what did good progressives think? Good forward thinking, modern minded progressives were all eugenicists in the twenties, right? Eugenicists were the forward looking educated, the world is ours kinds of people. If we probably with all of our profiles were operating uh, in the 1920s and 30s, we all would be eugenicists. <laughs> and we'd all be pretty freaking appalled by it today, right? So these ideas like shift and change, sure. Yeah, I think we would be in favor of making birth control available, I think, right? But, but you read, yeah, like Sanger has come in for reevaluations by many people especially women of color for like absolutely horrific ideology. Um, and so beloved by people of goodwill and good intent and a few decades later, absolutely horrifying to people of goodwill and good intent. Um, and I think that's why it's useful to be sort of like slowed down when thinking uh, and maybe yeah, and maybe pulled back from being at the barricades all the time when thinking about how do we present, uh, how do we present ideas? Because they, some of them are going to get reevaluated. And uh, I mean, I know people who do disability studies today, and and who are close to the Catholic worker movement, and who are like, we gotta, we gotta deal with the eugenicism of the Catholic worker movement in those years in Dorothy's writing. Jeez, well, that's not what they would have said then, right? Like that's a terrifying and scary word but we think differently now than we did then. And we obviously are thinking differently about multiple things and we're gonna reassess them too. So there's, um, I don't know what that is. I mean, maybe I end up sounding like a Vaticanist or something like that's an argument for slowness, oddly enough, right? <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a comment in the chat for, uh, that was directed at the panelists from Joanne Kennedy uh, from the current uh, Catholic worker community in New York. Uh, and Joanne uh, writes that says, Dorothy was careful about not intentionally printing anything that violated church teaching, uh, which is why that she is still able to be considered for sainthood now, though that was surely not the reason for her keeping inside the church's pale. Uh, we continue to struggle with her stance to honor her, but also to not be afraid to push the envelope. Uh, end quote there. Uh, I think it's also interesting that when Peter Morin saw the who proposed to Dorothy right in, in December of 32, he proposes to her, let's you should start a newspaper. And she she's all excited about that, as she says later on, you know, what journalist doesn't dream of having her own newspaper. Uh, and of course, if you look at her early history and see how she was mistreated in these newsrooms, even in the even in the uh, the lefty papers by male editors and others, right, and how underpaid she was and underappreciated she was, no wonder someone Someone would want their own their own paper, uh, but so but when Peter saw saw the first proofs of the paper, he felt that she wasn't getting it. She wasn't going far enough, right? She wasn't reconstructing, creating, proposing a new utopia like he wanted. So he had his name with withdrawn from the masthead. So uh, you know, current these at the intersection of these these different voices. Uh, yeah, Anna. Other questions that you that that you see coming from the chat and other places. So here's a question um, about journalism. This is from Nick Lewitz, who was a professor of journalism at the college and an advisor for the Quadrangle, our student newspaper. Does the panel of guidance or advice for student journalists who share the challenges of covering their immediate community while balancing their desires to see certain aspects of the community improve? Did you read that last part? Do we have input for that? It, yeah, advice or guidance. Um, if I could try to respond to that, um, I think for me, um, while I was trying to understand what it meant to be a reporter and to be kind of, what does this word objective mean? Um, I think sometimes I would see a story and I would be talking about it, you know, to Olga and I'd be like, I really want to cover this, but it seems too personal. Um, 
And she kind of pushed and reflected with me aloud to say that just because the issue is personal, you know, to you does not mean you should not report on it. And the power of reporting is that I could tell this anecdotal story about how COVID impacted my family specifically, and I could move people. But there is something powerful about saying that my anecdotal story about my family, I could actually interview people across the country and that they could have the same experience and that also they're looking to respond to this. So I say that as someone who like, you know, my dad was a contract worker during the pandemic and was a frontline worker. And then as soon as we decided we didn't care about essential workers anymore, he was let go um, because he has a disability, right? And I can't pretend that that doesn't mean something for me or that it doesn't spark my own interest when I come to labor justice, disability justice. I am someone who identifies as Latina. I'm the first in my family to go to college. The fact that Dorothy Day didn't have a degree um, and still does journalism is incredible. And I also don't know which outlet would hire um, a young Latina without a degree, even if that said person is at the heart of the issues we all want to report at. And I don't say this as a mechanism for calling out media as much as I say, I think this is how we don't just look back and say that was really cool that she did that. I think it's a way as we say, what is special about Catholic media that sound, uh, keeps us outside of kind of this legacy media doesn't mean we hire people from the community that we interview them and then we realize, holy crap, as reporters, what does it mean to realize actually this person should be just writing this or reporting it themselves if they have the, the capacity and the desire to do so? Um, what does it mean to hire someone who doesn't have a college degree? Um, what does it mean if journalism is in fact a very white um, classist profession? What does it mean that like to pledge to hiring more diverse candidates means that you will probably have to spend more time with them to get to the journalistic 101. Are we willing to do that? And I say all of that as someone who, you know, doesn't just witness that firsthand, but when I'm interviewing folks, when I'm talking to a lot of those that I mentor who are first in their family to go to college, this is some of the push and pull when it comes to truly living out their vocation. It's not a matter of fear. It's a matter of um, obligation to, you know, financially support not just yourself, but you sometimes are your parents' retirement plan, right? You are your community's um, hope and instillment and the first to leave your home. And if your journalism job is not paying to take care of not just you, but your family, you're not going to take it, right? And so as Catholic media, I think we could actually do the way of saying like, no, we pay you know, just wages, and we hire those without a college degree, and we have cultural competency around class and who gets to report on subjects, and oh, like, you were a leader in this movement. Actually, you're not, you're not um, less qualified. You're even more qualified because you're not going to a faraway community that you're not from and reporting and then leaving. You are reporting from that community, and you know the names of the people who are most impacted, and I think that's that's authentic and that's that's hard, um, especially like Colleen was saying in the, in the day of remote and um, social distancing. And it is so important because I think my last kind of point to this is that, you know, day went back and forth about the welfare state and um, government social security. And like, um, I was at a, a panel last night that talked about how so many of these social networks and programs that came um, through during the pandemic were some of the first times we saw folks lifted out of their poverty, right? And that's amazing and that's beautiful. That's worth celebrating and we can promotize, you know, welfare state, government, social security, and um, who wasn't included in things like stimulus checks? Well, if you didn't have citizenship, you didn't get a stimulus check, right? And then if we want to look at like what is resistance to that look like, there were plenty of Catholic churches that then formed their own stimulus check to give to undocumented families. And also what does it look like to kind of like what I think Day pushes me to say, how do we write about that beautifully? How do we make sure that every voice is captured? And how do we also say, what does it mean that government programs don't include like the 50 million essential workers who are undocumented? Um, and that's where I think the beauty of vocation in journalism, but also this question of like, how do we practice it as journalists? 
really challenges us in this moment of COVID. Great. Anna, I one or two more questions you want to Yes, so we have another question in the Q&A box. Um, what relationship does the current phrase speak truth to power mean to you in your journalistic ministry? You have to call in us, Kevin. Okay. I've talked to okay. Marshall, Colleen, Colleen, what is, what is <laughs> as explainer journalism, I, I, that's a new term, <laughs> I love it. Uh, and I also movement journalism, uh, I really love those, the, discovering this. What, but what does truth to power mean to you, Colleen? I, I hesitated to answer because like, I almost think of that phrase as a cliche now, <laughs> even though I think that it's really important. You just hear it all the time. Um, but no, I mean, at its heart, I think that like journalism is about speaking truth to power, right? It's about, I, another permutation of the phrase is, is uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, which I always found very inspiring. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that having the audacity to like talk to and report on people who are being screwed by the system, as Eileen said, uh, and, and putting it into a publication that you know that the operators at the top of the system read, that's speaking truth to power, in my opinion, in, in, in its simplest form. Yeah. I think there's a value in thinking about Dorothy's confounding, the Catholic workers confounding way, right? Um, not easy to classify, not easy to fit in history of social change, right, in any of the movements that it's participated in. Um, anachronistic in some ways, way ahead of its time in some ways, really difficult to deal with in a ton of ways, um, which is what's great, right? Like that's sort of what's beautiful. It's very, yeah, it's a difficult place. Um, and I think among the reasons that it's difficult in all sorts of good ways, right? Um, is because it's not only practical, uh, it, well, it's spiritual. And so in thinking about, um, like about vocation, the vocation of a journalist and, and how Dorothy is, it's, she, her work inspires me to, that she thought clearly of journalism as instrumentalizing um, her faith, it, it, instrumentalizing her her spiritual life. So it wasn't that these things were separate, right? Um, but that her journalism was a part of her spiritual life. Um, not just in a like, I wanna do good work, but like, this is part of my mission is to do this work. And so like Kevin had a, a question about vocation and you know, it's like this lovely word that you're raised with if you, if you go to Catholic school of always being taught about vocation, not just becoming a nun or a priest, but like, what is God calling you for you specifically? Um, and it takes most of us a long time to really quite figure that out and figure out how that's different than career and how that's different or the same as job. Um, but that this way of understanding journalism is part of a spiritual practice, part of a spiritual life. And so that, that listening and seeing and telling were part of her integration of the corporal works of mercy or maybe of the spiritual works of mercy into her life, into her, her daily practice of life. Um, and that she put herself right there as an act of prayer, right? I mean, there's, there's all those columns and all those, you know, it's almost like poetry of like being on the soup line and seeing Christ in the soup line. And I think we're, we're all sort of familiar with that way of thinking, but she was doing that in the writing and in the thinking and in the reporting and in the, the pieces that are really analysis pieces that that is part of her spiritual practice is to think and to report and to tell. Um, in a way, maybe putting herself persona triste by being the one who sees and who listens and who proclaims. So maybe we're more used to the, I, Christ is gonna come in a distress, distressing disguise 
and I, I see them all the time on the subway, but actually wait, maybe in me listening and, and seeing, right. Being honest enough to see and to say what you see uh, and then, and then to, to write, to proclaim what you see that that's, it's actually pushing in a, in a different, right. You're turning the spinning a little bit. Uh, and, and I think that's the, that's like the vocation that Dorothy had is that she was willing to see and she didn't stop seeing and she didn't stop seeing even when it was really inconvenient and like offended her old friends and crisscrossed across these complicated movement politics and alienated people and got her like denounced from certain circles. She's still willing to see and to just be honest with that vision. And that is hard to do. It's hard to do not only because we live in a racist capitalist society, but it's also hard to do because whatever group people are in, they know that they're right. And the journalist is the person who's like, ah, but maybe, right? And I think that's totally what the Catholic worker is, right? Is the person who's like, ah, but maybe. Um, and so it's why it's, like, it's not always popular. Um, and anyway, it's like the honesty to not close your eyes, right? And that's a spiritual act. And I, I think that for me is one of the most powerful things um, about her ministry as a journalist, a very different kind of journalist than the kind I am and one who did a lot more polemic than I'm interested in, but it's that refusing to pretend that you don't see, uh, including among your own, including among the people who you want to win, but you're not gonna say you don't see. So you, so you have to talk about that too. And you have to write about that too. I think that is what distinguishes a journalist from an activist and they're both really necessary, but they're both really necessary. They're different things. Uh, and we want really powerful and eloquent and relentless activists. And we want journalists who will write about them. Um, and there's, there's, you know, Dorothy's not the only person who moves on both sides of that column, but they're different sides of a column. And so you can move from one to the other. And, and of course, all kinds of recruiting things should be happening. To the point about like hiring people who don't have college degrees, very few newspaper reporters had college degrees in 1920. Even in 1970, very few newspaper reporters had college degrees, male or female, uh, white or Latino or black. Um, and there was a very pro, like a very expansive black press in the United States in the 19 teens, in the 1930s, and the 1970s. There was a very expansive Latino press in Spanish and English in the U.S. from the 1860s forward. Right, there was always a very big press in in many colors and in many languages, and in English, Anglo, European, in Spanish, in people from various countries and black people from this country, not a lot of people had college degrees. I mean, like some of my best mentors, daily news reporters did not have college degrees in the 1970s and they were white men. Uh, the industry changed as it professionalized um, and it was a loss to everybody. It was definitely a giant loss to everybody. Um, but anyway, that's my. So it looks like our time is almost coming to an end. So before we wrap up, do you have any last words or anything you'd like to say based on our conversation today or anything at all? I think my last thought, just because I'm seeing some chat responses down here about folks who are interested in journalism. I don't even know if push back is the right thing because I don't think I'm pushing back on what Eileen is saying. I think we are both trying to wrestle with Dave's legacy. And I think, I think for a lot of folks who are on the cusp of Gen Z and millennial identity, um, they're told that they can be Catholic or they can be activists. They're told they can be journalists or they can be activists. Um, and so many don't want to choose. They want to do both and they want to do all, and they want to not be kind of in this binary. And so I think when Eileen kind of, you know, you're saying it, it's like a movement back and forth that they did. Um, I think I'm kind of challenged to say, what does it mean to just sit in the middle to say, I am a journalist and I am an activist and I am a Catholic and I am this and this and not buts, um, but ands, <laughs> right? Um, which is not grammatically correct. Um, 
but I say that because I think um, sometimes when we tell folks to choose, what ultimately ends up happening is that there is a, well, then that space is not for me, instead of a, how do we make the space feel that it is for folks who, who carry these multiple identities and don't, don't want to choose or don't feel like they can choose, right? It's too personal to choose. It's not I'm advocating or I'm an activist on said issue because it's a cool issue that I studied, right? It's because it's really deeply personal and to not be an activist around that would be to not be you, right? And have this really good reporting, have this really easy to read accessible media um, that makes sense to folks. Um, so I think my final thought would be that um, as Pope Francis has invited us to do is there needs to be intergenerational dialogue. There's so much for all of us to learn from each other. And I think that this opportunity that we're having right here where all of us come from different experiences and um, time in the field and time in the church and um, expertise around day, this is what I would invite us to do more often in the name of you know synodality as well, but especially with folks who are like, journalism is not for me because I don't want to choose between those identities or because I financially can't do it or because, you know, all of these reasons and say, how do we make vocation this accessible term would be like my final thought around that. Yeah, I, uh, I would echo some of what Melissa said. I, I also think, as I mentioned earlier, that like there is all this pressure within the media world right now to, you know, do very first person journalism or to write, you know, these like analysis pieces that are maybe stepping into opinion and so on. Um, yeah. So I think that, I think that probably as like an industry as a whole, if I can say that we're, we're still reckoning with this question of separating out your, your personal beliefs from your, uh, you know, your reporting and so on. And, yeah, I, I guess I would just say, like, as somebody who's still wrestling with this, I think that if you do have one foot in the activism world, that your reporting can help you to uh, evaluate that, you know, more objectively, to use a, a hot word that we've been using a lot, but, you know, to recognize those problems and to do some of that pushing back and also to get to know people. In who are who are on the ground, who are you know at the at the front lines of these issues, or who are affected by them, I think that that is a really valuable perspective to then be able to bring to the movement that you are interested in. Um, and yeah, I guess I guess I'll just leave it there. I think that I still am am figuring this out too. That's why I mentioned that Dorothy's like stance in this is one of the big challenges of her for me. Uh, I would also say in terms of vocation and like combining faith with journalism, which we haven't talked a whole lot about, but I really liked what Eileen said about, you know, acting. I love that you use the words in, in persona Christi, like acting as, as Christ, trying to see people as, as Jesus sees other people. Um, I also find that like writing is, is a spiritual practice for me and writing stories because I'm trying to see people with that lens of charity and communicate, you know, what they have told me, honestly. Um, and yeah, this, this, I'm like, I'm always embarrassed to talk about faith despite being a Vatican reporter, but I'm, I, I also pray to the Holy Spirit before I write a piece. I think you should do that too. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> Right. See, it's only Catholics who have this strange desire not to talk about their faith. And right? It, it serves us very poorly because it means that only some people talk about faith. And it, it sometimes means that only some kinds of Catholics talk about faith. But uh, people on a more progressive end are so conditioned to embarrassment in talking about faith because we don't offend anybody. Um, and, you know, like I am taught a great deal by all of my all of my Muslim students who don't have that problem. Who are like, yes, this is who I am. It's really written on me. This is my faith. And like the problem, if there's this person who has a problem with it, it's you, it's not me, right? Like, yeah, I think there's a I think there's a really tremendous impoverishment of the public discourse because progressive or radical or left or whatever Catholics who take religion deeply seriously, like so seriously that it completely defines our life, 
but were embarrassed to speak in religious terms in public. And therefore, these ideas don't, like they're only in these types of circles. And, and we know that progressive social movements are impoverished by not having a religious voice, right? By not having a fluency in religion um, and, and that they're hungry for it. And, and so, you know, we've seen this in the last couple of years, movements actually, yes, making space um, for a whole heterodox types of ways of talking about spirituality within movement. And that's rich. There's never been a progressive social movement in the United States that has not been religiously based. There has never been a progressive social movement in the United States that has not been religiously based, right? Going, going from like early anti-colonialism, like going from like indigenous resistance, calling on their religious faith to resist colonization, moving through abolition, moving through the progressive movement of the 1920s, moving into like temperance earlier than that, the civil rights movement, there's right, the feminist movement, there's never been a religious, a social movement in the United States, a progressive movement that has not been religious. And yet our tremendous discomfort in talking about religion writes that stuff out. And it has the effect of writing out tremendous numbers of people of color who were instrumental and important parts of every movement historically and every movement contemporarily. But if you remove the religion from it, because you want to sanitize it because you don't want to make anybody uncomfortable it's impoverished and it's not true right so like back to like the old-fashioned journalist i just want the facts and the facts are that that it's the religion is a key part of any movement for social change it always has been it's also a key part of any movement reactionary against social change and let's not pretend that's not true but but i think it's like yes People can talk about sex, people can talk about money, people should be able to talk about religion. It is the defining like infrastructure of most people in the world's entire lives. And so, yeah, I pray to the Holy Spirit before I write. I can say that out loud. Wow, excellent. I think I think Eileen has has opened up the possibility for maybe another topic for another webinar at some point on this and Colleen as well. And and thank you to uh, thank you to all four of you uh, for for your work in tagging and promoting this event. Our friend Lois Har, she talked about how journalism is can be holy work. And I think that that's really true. And and when I read the the work that the three of you do and and also our student student uh, journalists in our in our newspaper on campus here, I, I really I really affirm that. So thank you to all three of you. Please, uh, friends, if you're if you want to support the getting the word out about Dorothy Day as a fascinating human being, please consider going to the DorothyGill.org website. Uh, we really need some support for continuing the work we're doing and promoting her legacy. Uh, so I'd really appreciate if folks can can send some love to the Dorothy Day Guild uh, organization and effort there uh, to organize more events like this. So thank you all, and uh, look forward. To to, uh, to, to connecting with others as we go. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to me if there's any ways I can be of assistance to you and we can promote the story. Thank you all. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Colleen, Eileen, and Melissa. Uh, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.